we don't uh, waste any more time. Um, I think we've got a third panelist come. I think we'll just each introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm the founder of Liberty.me. I call myself the Chief Liberty Officer, and also I'm the Director of Digital Development for the Foundation for Economic Education. I have a consulting role, with, a role in the Bitcoin space with Factum, which is a 2.0 company, and then also with a Let's Talk uh, Bitcoin. My name is Demelza Hayes. I'm a fellow at the Mercatus Center. I'm a fellow at the Mises Institute. I'm one half of the Bitcoin couple. The other half is in the back. Uh, thank you. So Julia will be here, I think, uh, probably here c uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, but just a couple of things that I just want to point out that I think are, because uh, everybody's concerned about Bitcoin ad adoption. You know, like how do, we, how do we get from where we are now to making this a full-fledged money that's maybe competitive with, uh, with, with, with nation-state money? That's the big question on every liberty lover's mind. You know, beyond, I think one thing to remember is that Bitcoin was only invented like six years ago, so that's pretty amazing. Um, it took a long time be between the invention of electricity, the discovery of electricity, and the, and the time when you could actually turn on a light in your room to uh, you know, cause it to light up your room. So we have a long way to go. Um, one thing I think we need to think about, though, is to remember that, because I always get this question. P people say, oh, Bitcoin, I can't, I can't buy a sandwich with that. You know, I can't buy a pizza at the local pizza store with that. Uh, at least two or three years ago is what everybody used to tell me, right? N now, of course, you, you can more or less do that, you know, using gift cards and all sorts of things. Uh, but I think the important thing to remember about Bitcoin is that it's actually not a currency for physical spaces. It's, it's, it's supposed to be an, a currency for the Internet. That's actually much more important. That's why Internet adoption is so high. And the Internet, uh, Bitcoin, you can pretty much do anything you, you want to do. Just Julia, want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Julia Taransky, and I run a website called Brave the World. Sorry for being late, I lost a little, I lost track of time. It's Porkfest after all. Nice and sunny morning, but uh, please continue. Oh, yeah, I was just talking about some of the myths uh, about Bitcoin. So there's that one. The other thing is that there's, there's a very large network effect associated with dollars. Um, you know, so the, of course, I mean, for, dollars work for most people most of the time. Uh, and, and credit cards work for most of us most of the time. Although, I have to say that I'm getting extremely annoyed with the whole credit card thing. I mean, it's getting, it was not only the, uh, the fee is very intense, you know, but I don't know what's going on with, with me and credit cards, but it seems like I get one stolen about every six to eight weeks nowadays, you know? Um, really, it happens all the time. And I'm pretty sophisticated with this stuff, uh, so I don't know how or why it happens to me. But, uh, you know, they'll call me up and say, but, you know, did you buy, um, were, you know, were, were you, did you, did you, sp did you spend um, $300 at, uh, you know, uh, Fred's strip club in Miami last night? <laughs> and I said, well, are there any other transactions? Well, apparently you were one, you were, you know, at the same time, this is why we're suspicious, on the same evening you were in Atlanta uh, buying gasoline. So they'll say, you know, is one of these fraudulent? And I'll say, well, yes, without telling them which, of course, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's, but um, so, the, so then they have to take my credit card away. This happens to me all the time. And we're all subject to the, and it's not just credit card fraud, which, you know, which, which costs billions and tens of billions of dollars a year to p protect against. But it's also identity theft. I mean, this even happened to me. <laughs> I think it was around the time of, of that last, of the Bitcoin conference in Disney World, right? So, uh, you know, there I was, and I was, I was taking a, a nap or something, and the phone rang. They said, hi, this is Wells Fargo. Uh, you know, there's been a, a fraud reported on your debit card. Please type in your debit card number. I said, well, okay. So I typed in, they said, now type in your PIN number. I said, well, okay. They said, now type in your social security number. And so I got all the way to the, almost to the last digit, and I thought, Wait just a minute. <laughs> this is a little bit fishy. So I, I quickly hung up and, and called the bank and said, no, there's nothing wrong with your de debit card at all. Of course, it was a case of identity theft. If I had put in one more number, oh. you know, it would have been, you know, potential calamity there, you know. So anyway, so what's wrong with these systems? They're all based in trust. That's the key thing to understand about these money substitutes we call credit cards. 
they are trust-based systems. And, you know, they originated when, you know, department stores, you would, they would recognize your face and they'd say, well, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, we trust you, we know you're good for it. Uh, you can take whatever clothes you want. We'll just put it on your account and send you a bill. And that's where the credit card c came from. And that works fine for those of us who have, you know, uh, a lot of you know, financial means and access to financial intermediaries and that sort of thing, but it doesn't work so well for, uh, you know, two-thirds of the world's population. And that's where these trustless systems come in. Yeah, and they're not very business-friendly, are they? Because uh, if you're a merchant and you're accepting Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, you're paying pretty high percentages on that. And it's like they're, you know, I'm not going to talk about corporations. I'm going to talk about middle class family businesses or little chains that people open up. Uh, you know, people that build c economies and countries, basically. And they're paying huge percentages on Visa and MasterCard and all this. And what ends up happening is they have to up the price of their goods or services. So you're using your credit card and you're getting your points, but you're actually you know, inadvertently paying more for those goods and services than you may, would have had to. And a lot of businesses, especially European and Asian ones, they'll give you like a tax-free cash discount. Um, and so they're not, I mean, the convenience is there and you can do a lot with credit cards, but they only really help like the individual consumer well until your identity gets stolen and the, you know nobody can help you after that S and also chargebacks i think because of chargebacks a lot of bigger businesses have to raise their prices because how many times did they lose out on orders or loads of money because some not honorable person just charges back the credit card through their company and gets free goods and the company has to you know pay for that well they don't pay for that the other customers pay for it right so that's something that doesn't really that's not really an issue with bitcoin that's so that's just a pract uh, more of a practical thing um do we have like a f or we're just there's no, a flow there's, there's no fo format whatsoever yeah. do you want, do you have any on that? i just would i think one of the main problems with adoption of bitcoin is our culture uh, we just aren't really ready to embrace the digital money. Uh, we do use a lot of digital currency through the fiat system, but we don't think of it that way. We still think of it as a physical good. We still think of it as physical money. And I think that it took, it, it took a long time for people to adopt credit cards. It's, it's going to take a long time for people to adopt Bitcoin. We have to give them, give them a value proposition. One of the things that Andreas and I did in Liechtenstein was we went to, f we went to restaurants and businesses and we said, you're going to save 2.5% on your credit card fees, and also you're going to get the money at the end of the day every day. A lot of small businesses have to wait 30 days to get their money from Visa when they make a purchase, when they make a sale. And Bitcoin, through BitPay, will deposit that amount um, instantly every day at the end of the day. So we gave them a value proposition, and I think that we need to go out and we need to, and we did that for free, of course. We just got businesses signed up for free, tell, taught them how to start accepting Bitcoin, and we're going to start doing that in Auburn, where we live right now in Alabama. Just, just give people a value proposition. Why is it valuable for them to use it? I think that certain firms will see that there is, um, they're going to be able to get the upper hand on their competition by just accepting Bitcoin. Now, how do you get more individuals using it? Because I find right now what's happened is a lot of merchants accept Bitcoin, but not enough people are actually buying and using Bitcoin. So you, that's why that's part of the contributing reason of why the price has been going down. Because we have all these merchants, but they don't actually keep their big like through BitPay. They don't keep their Bitcoin most of the time. They'll convert it to um, fiat money right away, which doesn't help the price because you're not you know you're not investing in it. You're not uh, storing it. You're keeping it. You're not using it. You're just turning it back into America. So the f we'll see Bitcoin become like a real thing. Not that it's not, but for the general public, not when every merchant accepts it, but when every person feels like it's accessible to them, that, that they can use it easily. And we're seeing this issue here at Porkfest because, you know, the internet, you know, we're in the boonies and the internet's a bit iffy. And I'm, you know, I'm doing a Bitcoin booth and I'm trying to, sell Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin, and teach Bitcoin, and you know, oh, this is so easy. Oh, I don't have a Wi-Fi signal, I can't send you this Bitcoin. Uh, oh, I love to buy, I'm so happy you're accepting Bitcoin, I'd love some pulled pork. Oh, I can't pay you because I have no Wi-Fi signal. So 
these are issues that will be solved when you know we the things like mesh networks will become popular when uh, more distributed forms of internet will become popular so technology you don't have just these like hubs of technology that grow on their own you it's it's cohesive and it feeds itself. So you can't have one thing without the other. If we don't have very accessible internet everywhere all the time, then Bitcoin will be a lot slower to adopt. So, and that's why places like Tel Aviv and Berlin and like more high tech places and big cities, you see more adoption because everybody has Wi Fi, everyone has 4G. Let's go ahead and take a, go ahead. A question. Go ahead. Yeah. adopt Bitcoin, you use the analogy of electricity, but a hundred years ago I didn't see the government banning electricity before it became widespread, or credit cards. Forty years ago, no one used them when I started, but there was no chance of the federal government banning them. But now, I worry about you know, governments banning it. If the U.S. bans it, because of the, you know, we have a predominant share in the financial world market, no one else is going to want it. So. I think the car example is good for this, yeah, right? Well, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's just it's you know, <laughs> the you know the threat isn't the ban. The threat is regulation. You know, uh, and electricity was absurdly regulated as soon as it became you know became useful domestically and industrially. It was it was practically nationalized in this country, and still remains that way. By the way, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I, it's 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 an incredible thing just how old fashioned. Uh, the grid is and all that's associated with it, like, like American plugs, you know, like you know our digital equipment gets ever more tiny and tiny and tiny and tiny. Except you still have to have this gigantic apparatus thing to plug it into the wall, you know. <clears throat> that's because of the, because of the government. You know, I don't have to tell you that. Um, and yeah, the car example is a good one. Julia was going to mention that you know, in the UK they so heavily regulated cars that they required three three people for every every car. You know, one to you know, one to steer or something, one to drive, and the other person to run out in front of the car with a, with a flag waving it to warn, you know, passengers, you know. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, many people have argued that this is why the car was never really developed in the UK uh, to the extent that it did in the US. The US became the leader of the industry. So, you know, I, I, th this is the situation of Bitcoin. I mean, anybody who regulates it, is going to pay a serious price. They're going to lose capital. It's going to be capital flight. It's going to be sort of a backwards industry. Already, many Bitcoin companies are are are, are uh, avoiding New York and Wyoming now because of the re regulations. The, they're moving, they're and moving out, uh, yeah. the California bill, the bit license, passed. So we're going to see, you know, San Francisco, which is you know the tech hub of America. We're going to see probably huge migration, maybe to Texas. Uh, maybe overseas. So that's going to be interesting, people moving out of San Francisco to develop tech companies. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Well, I think that one of the great features of Bitcoin uh, is that its transmission speed is, is very fast and it's also very hard to confiscate. So. A ban on it, I think, you know, could diminish some people's interest, some people's demand for, for Bitcoin, but I don't think that this could happen worldwide. It wouldn't affect a, a lot of countries where enforcement is very weak. And even in the U.S., it would be very hard. They could put the, the rule on the, on the paper, but it's going to be very hard to enforce as far as uh, people storing Bitcoins on paper wallets. It would be very hard for the government to know that they have Bitcoin. And it, this is very different from gold, whereas in 1933, when the government asked Americans to turn in all their gold, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, uh, forced them to turn in all their gold, this just can't happen with Bitcoin. I mean, people could voluntarily give up their Bitcoins if they wanted to, or they can get pushed out of a chair in a library <laughs> uh, physically and have their Bitcoins stolen from them, but that's really just... We're in the beginning. I think that there's going to be a lot of additional features that are going to add to the safety and uh, uh, security of Bitcoin as we there's go forward. A, there's a great joke. Um, how do you get your Bitcoin stolen? With a wrench. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's like, well, that's you know, it. 
it's very important to also understand that there's a sense in which industry right now, the Bitcoin industry, the infrastructure industry, is, is yeah, not welcoming regulation, but there's a sense in which it wouldn't be entirely unwelcome because of the regime uncertainty. Everybody's afraid of what the laws are going to be. And also there's a widespread perception that Bitcoin ad adoption has been limited because it sort of exists under a cloud, you know? People think that it's, it's sort of sketchy, maybe it's used for drugs or something like that. And uh, for government to regulate it is a way of sort of conferring a bit of legitimacy on Bitcoin. Uh, so many people in the industry are sort of not entirely unhappy about this just because they can't imagine that a currency of this level of global power and efficacy could ever really live outside a regulatory structure. So to me, that, that makes me very sad, actually. You know, when you see business sort of angling for regulation because they otherwise would, are facing bans and living under a cloud. So this is un one, unfortunately one of the consequences of having a state, which is why I think we ought to just go ahead and you know, pretty much get rid of the entire state. You know, <laughs> that's pretty much what I've been thinking. <laughs> but but I, I don't know how likely that is, you know. And there's, there exists this uh, incredible double standard with Bitcoin and cash, right? People say, oh, Bitcoin is used, can be used for this and this. And no, you, you can send Bitcoin to ISIS and you can buy drugs and arms with Bitcoin. And meanwhile, America, the U.S. dollar is funding uh, incredible wars and drug smuggling and arms dealing. And all of, you know, people are paying murderers with cash right now. And yet, no, but that's, you know, that currency is approved by the state. And, you know, it's just a byproduct of something good. But Bitcoin's different because it's new. And I, for a while, I really wanted to make a video uh, promoting Bitcoin. And you know how there's these videos say, oh, you can go like buy an ice cream and like buy a coffee and pay for your plane ticket. Well, I wanted to do a video where, you, you know, a shot in the parking lot and a guy opens up his trunk and he has a firearm and you pay with Bitcoin. And then, you know, you're on the Silk Road and you pay in Bitcoin. And then, you know, you're uh, sending, um, money laundered, uh, you know, Bitcoin to overseas f to your family or something and just kind of promoting these other dark uses for the uh, for the currency and maybe at the end making the comparison to cash. I think that would be really funny and isolating from a lot of the legitimate Bitcoiners that are starting startups since El Palo and stuff. So it's just something to keep in mind, the double standard here, which hopefully will slowly disintegrate as we do get more adoption and understanding of this tech. I mean, to my mind, even <coughs> if Bitcoin were regulated just as heavily as dollar transactions were, that it would, it's still a much more modern technology. And, and it's, I think is one of the reasons why you don't see such aggressive moves on the part of central banks against Bitcoin, because everybody's aware that it's just far superior technologically. I mean, th the critical thing to remember about Bitcoin is that it's both a payment system and a money in one single thing. And that's very difficult for people to, to conceive of. We're used to th thinking of dollars as separate from Visa and you know, Euros as, as different from, from a MasterCard or, or PayPal or whatever. But within the Bitcoin network, they're all one and the same. So it's just a, it's a vastly superior system. I mean, Bitcoin, uh, like I explained in my first speech, the, the advantage of it is that it behaves like real physical property, you know, it, like in a peer-to-peer -peer way. It's, it's literally like, like taking, you know, it's, it's like gold. I mean, it's like taking a gold coin and sort of porting it across the world, you know, instantly at zero cost. It's, it's amazing. The chargebacks thing, I'm not sure you under, entirely understood the, the Julia's point about chargebacks, but this is a very serious issue for, for merchants. Um, merchants lose, like, you know, just a lot of money every year with uh, dealing with chargebacks. I mean, people uh, calling them up and, you know, they'll you know, take the credit card, the credit card goes through, they ship the goods, and then uh, uh, the, 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 then the, the card is, you know, ultimately refused or, you know, um, what oftentimes that happens is that the customer will, will get the goods and then call up, call up the company and say, You're, the shoes never arrived, or the dress never arrived. And there's, there's no way the company has to verify that, you know, if they're using the U.S. Postal Service. So, so the person, you know, they have to give the money back, basically, and the person has the goods. And the, these kind of chargeback rackets are, are, are constant. It's, it's really, tr you know, it's unbelievably tragic, actually. 
It's, it's like a pillaging of business. So this is, there's no problem with this in the Bitcoin world. What's his name? Um, who am I trying to think of? The, the sort of gold investor guy who was uh, so against Bitcoin for so long? Peter, Peter Schiff. Schiff. Peter Schiff, Schiff, yeah. So Schiff never, you know, he's, uh, never, he never bothered to take any time to understand Bitcoin, you know, because uh, uh, he's too busy talking, you know, instead of like reading or something. Uh, that's just Peter. But um, when his company began to accept Bitcoin, he came running up to me, you know, with a, with a, in a frenzy. He was so fired up. He said, it's unbelievable. When a person buys my products, my gold with, uh, with Bitcoin, you know, I get the money basically instantly instead of having to wait four or five days and having to pay four or five percent. I get it, I get it instantly. I don't have to pay anything for it. He's, you know, he was ama he's, he's explaining this to me. That's typical Peter Schiff, right? <laughs> I'm standing there, yeah. Yes, Peter, we've been yes. trying to tell you this for a while. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about talking about this, and I got a few things to say. Um, I got into the Bitcoin at probably the worst possible time when it was about $1,200 a piece. And I bought about four, actually five, two of them for my parents, three for myself. And um, then about two weeks later, Black Friday hit, it started crashing, and so... I've been very reluctant to spend it personally, and I think I kind of ruined it in the <laughs> its reputation in the minds of my parents. But the thing is, is that I don't think it's just regime uncertainty. I think the the price is a big thing with it because it's just so it just fluctuates so much. Did, did you sell yet? I mean, no, I haven't sold. Then I mean, you haven't lost money. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's that's I mean, how you have to think about it. Right. So if you no, hold on to it and it goes up, I am up. still holding on to it. But the thing is, is that. They're, they're not thinking of it in terms of currency just because of how much the price fluctuates and there's so much market uncertainty as well as regime uncertainty sure. in their minds. So, I mean, the idea that, like, BitPay uses um, instant, instantly converts it back to fiat, I mean, maybe that's not necessarily ideal, but if you can, if we can use that, that, that perception, I mean, if that's a perception that sells Bitcoin, that people can use it as a medium of exchange to get dollars, and then the, they've got the Bitcoin infrastructure in place, and then hyperinflation hits, well, that would make transition a little easier, and then it's just the idea of explaining it to them. And also, um, on regulation, I mean, I've also heard that some, some governments are considering accepting tax payments in Bitcoin, like um, income tax or whatever, and on, I mean, contrary to what uh, some people might think about not, not wanting to give the government more Bitcoins, if they're accepting Bitcoin as ta payment in taxes, that gives um, the, uh, the tax serfs a lot more power to hold on to their, to their, uh, to their, to their uh, assets. So I think the idea that I mean, maybe if the people who work within the system should encourage it, but I think the, the idea that taxes being accepted in Bitcoin is not necessarily a net negative because it gives us a lot more control over it. The, the nice thing about Bitcoin is that all of these things can work together. Uh, if, you know, if people start paying their taxes in Bitcoin, that doesn't mean you can't you know, buy a ticket with Bitcoin or keep it in a cold wallet. Like, these things don't cancel each other out. Same if people are using BitPay in their small businesses and they just want to be secure and trade it into uh, USD right away. That's fine, too. Uh, but we need the whole picture for right. it to function as an ecosystem, right? Right. So... My point is the fact that, like, th things like that, that would help sell it to... Um, the mainstream middle America sheeple, whatever, yeah. and um, it, it would it would gain more widespread acceptance. And then once people see that see it as more legitimate, that's when we can use what's already available to us in a much more radical way, ways to um, like cir circumvent the uh, state apparatus, things like that. There's a great debate in the Bitcoin community about banking and whether banking is going to start implementing Bitcoin because bank, the banking industry would save billions 
in transaction fees. They would save uh, billions in, because time is money. And if you're wiring money and all this, that's money. <laughs> so on one hand, banking will save so much, so much. Uh, so that's their incentive. And that will legitimize Bitcoin for a lot of sheeple, as you say. Uh, it, but it will, it would, in all honesty, would open up uh, the idea to the everyday regular person. So that's the positive. But then again, the banking industry, there's some banks who actually have it in their policy that you cannot send emails with encryption or PGP because banks don't want the, uh, they don't want their customers to be able to prove that a conversation occurred. They always want the power on their side, right? So this is an issue with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is unalterable and it, you know, it, it's very, um, you can, with banking, you can tie identities to it very legitimately and you can prove that something happened. And if they can't, if they don't even want their customers using secure and provable forms of communication because they don't want to be held liable for what they told their customer, they want to be able to lie about it, then that is a huge barrier for them adopting uh, a trustless currency into their systems, a trustless system. Then again, why should we trust them? Right, so there is, I mean, we're in a very gray area right now. That's what, just the drawback of living in a state of society, as far as I'm concerned. One point about the point at which you bought the, you bought at 1200, I've had so many people tell me that they got into the market at 1200. This is, this is very difficult, this is very conventional. What, what happens, and it's just not Bitcoin, it's, it's everything. It's, it's a matter of human psychology and their interaction with financial markets. People tend to buy in when there's a lot of sort of public frenzy about something. Every time they're turning on the news, they see some news about Bitcoin or whatever it is, the Amazon stock or Apple or whatever. Uh, people tend to buy in at the high. It's not that they're, they're trying to, you know, it's just that there's, there's a trigger that goes off in our minds when everybody's talking about the same thing, you know, you sort of, you know, that's the point at which you get interested in it. You get interested in it typically at its high. And then, and then the thing falls and, nobody, and everybody stops talking about it and that's when the smart money moves in and, and the, you know, the hoi polloi you know, get bored and, and don't know anything about it. So um, you know, the way it, what happened with Bitcoin over the last 18 months is actually very conventional. I've, I've had so many people just furious at me about this whole thing. I mean, why should they be mad at me? I mean, you know, I, I'm not actually like an advocate of, of investing in Bitcoin. I, I'm an advocate of using Bitcoin, essentially, you know, but uh, um, I also, you know, started writing about it when it was about uh, $13. So, you know, whatever. I mean, I, what I do is I have a regular buying program. I just set aside a certain amount of money every month and I just continue to accumulate, you know, and whatever the price is. But it strikes me that right now it's, it's what is it, about 250 Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, I think it was as low as 220 I think, within the last 12 months, yeah. So it seems like it's a fairly decent time to buy, it seems to me. But I, 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 I buy at whatever price. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, it's a great time to buy, and it might go a little bit lower in the summer. Also, it's been pretty stable for the past seven or eight months. I mean, relatively compared to its history. It's been around, it hasn't, it's only dipped under 200 like once or twice. It's only dipped under th over 300 once. It's been between 200 and 300 for the past seven to eight months. And uh, yeah, also, I mean, it, it, once more people start using it, it's not going to be uh, as volatile anymore. So right now we're in the adoption phase. We're, in the in we're not even in the adoption phase yet. We're in the innovation phase. So over time, this will just uh, decrease in volatility. And also there was a paper uh, published recently where they compared it to uh, the volatility of gold. And it, for the past year, it's only been 2 to 3% more volatile than gold. So uh, I, can, I can give that reference to people afterwards if they're interested in that paper. Yeah, oil is a great example, too. Oil was incredibly volatile for over 40 years. And people were like, this is a terrible investment. Oops. Yeah, I, I, when people complain about Bitcoin's volatility, I, I can't help but just think, you know, first world problems. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> fact that it exists at all is, to me, it's just awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, and, like, and like we said, you didn't lose any money until you sell. And uh, I was, uh, my parents, my dad doesn't like gold or silver. Like, he actually likes the American dollar. I know. So then one day, he comes up to me and he says, Julia, 
Um, this Bitcoin thing, could you, um, could you make an investment for me? <laughs> like, <laughs> here is some money. Could you make it so no one take it? <laughs> like, oh, okay, father. And I guess me, like, making my videos and, like, running to these conferences, you know, got him thinking and researching, and he just decided to go for it. My mom's still not sure, and she's like, oh, my God, we lost some money. And my dad's like, we did not lose money. We did not sell. So he gets it. Like, and it's really funny because he likes USD and hates gold and silver, but for some reason he just gets Bitcoin and really likes it. So... Just an example of, you know, you can reach people in very interesting ways and they can have very contradictory beliefs and it's okay. Well, the, the previous gentleman, he says he bought it at 1200 it's now dropped and he regrets it. I look at it, if Bitcoin was a good idea at 1200 it just went on sale yeah, and buy more. Great. The question I have for the panel, because I don't see many gray hairs up there, is... If you look back technologically, like MySpace was the first social media thing, and Facebook eventually swept them away. Is Bitcoin is the first crypto or digital currency? There's obviously competitors. Is the this technology likely to stay in Bitcoin, or is Bitcoin the first iteration of other ones that will follow? Do you I see any yeah. technical faults with the system itself? Well, that's a great point. Um, one thing that I like about Bitcoin is that it's open source. Okay. And I think that this is where it's going to differ from uh, other uh, first Like timers. AOL. I remember yeah. AOL was, you know, it was a closed community. With Bitcoin being open source, that means that as a competitor comes up on Bitcoin and they have a feature that people like and they're starting to use that currency or that, that cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin will be able, could possibly change their, their protocol and adapt, uh, adapt it to the, 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 competi the competition's features. So I think that in this case, open source is a little bit different than MySpace and Facebook. That's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, and Bitcoin itself is changing to this day. Um, it's still worked on. There's still features being implemented. What it started out as, it's been tweaked along the way. There's a big debate right now. You know, it, it's fluid in the way that it is, which is kind of a dangerous thing as well as a very good thing because it can adapt to the times. Well, I think the other thing too is unlike fiat money in the United States, there's competitors to Bitcoin. There's Litecoin and others. So if Bitcoin were to do something fishy, you know, the competition will sweep them aside. So, well, thank you. What is the new name for the Darkcoin protocol? That has a new name now. Dash. Dash coin? I think Dash. Just Dash? Okay, so I, I was really intrigued after the, I've been following that coin for a while, and then after the, the Roth Ulbricht uh, verdict came in, uh, it just went through the roof. I mean, it just, well, not through the roof, but I mean, it's, it's really uh, gained a lot of value in terms of dollars over the last six months, uh, partially in response to all the regulations. What this, this is, a, it's a very fun sort of plug-in protocol that, that, that makes all your Bitcoin pr uh, radically fungible. So what you spend, uh, what you spend is, is sort of mixed up with, with, with all the other coins in the system at the time, and then it comes out on the other end, and you can't uh, d provide any tracing between the, the two public keys at all. Um, so it makes it, uh, it anonymizes Bitcoin to a, a much a greater extent. Yeah, and it, that one was quite fluid, too, because when I was first looking at it, it was actually very centralized in the way it was mixing. Okay. So, yeah, so I didn't like that. But I think since then, they listened to feedback and they changed the protocol. So that's just an example of a coin listening to feedback and, you know, uh, listening to the market and changing itself. People get very confused about this, too. They oftentimes think that Bitcoin is like a company like AOL.com, you know, or something like that. And it's, it's, it's hard to remember that, that Bitcoin is just a, it's a technology that's available to everybody in the world. So in that sense, I don't think it has the same sort of burnout risk that you associate with, uh, you know, with compact computers or something like that. Um, you're all talking about how uh, it's... Bitcoin and being involved in the banking system, and I'm just curious about the um, how Bitcoin adoption, like the third world and the unbanked, could like really bring them into markets that they're not usually uh, privy to. And I'm wondering if there's been any like advances in the adoption in those spheres in the past few years. 
Well, there's a lot of adoption in Brazil. Uh, they recently had an IBM event where they rained Bitcoin on people and people could just lift their phone up in the sky and catch Bitcoins. Uh, there's also adoption in India. Uh, right now, I know an organization in India that's trying to get people to use Bitcoin. They understand it because they are very financially repressed. They can't take currency outside of the country. And Bitcoin's helping people uh, at least, you know, kind of hide their assets from the government. I think that this has a lot of potential in India. I used to live there, and I noticed that a lot of people did not have access to the uh, financial formal banking sector because they didn't have assets that were, uh, you know, worth it for the bank account to hold for them. And now with Bitcoin, they'll be able to be their own bank. They'll be able to hold on to currency, you know, in, you know, even if it's $100 worth, they'll be able to keep it with them. I think that it, this has a great potential in developing markets. It's a huge, uh, a huge issue for women in the Islamic world, uh, especially because they, they can't typically be, get bank accounts without the permission of their, their, their husband or father or something like that. Well, they can't get them at all. They can't really do anything without the permission of a man. So this is a problem for women entrepreneurs. Uh, they can do also, they have all sorts of skills, but if they can't get paid, you know, you're never finally free. So Bitcoin, this is why Bitcoin is very popular among women in Afghanistan in particular. Yeah. And I'll do a plug for a really good charity at this point. It's called Code to Inspire. And you can go to codetoinspire.org. And you can donate Bitcoin to help women in Afghanistan and young girls in Afghanistan learn how to code and program. And that way, you know, a lot of their parents don't let them go to school, let them go abroad or anything. So they can do this from home and they can make money from their computers and support their own families in the future. So check that out, Code to Inspire. Uh, just before we finish up, if there's any more questions, I just wanted to mention that afterwards, uh, I'll be available. And if you want to get a wallet on your phone, uh, I'll send you like a few Satoshis if you just want to see how it works. Yeah, just stick around and find me afterwards. Yep, or come to the Bitcoin booths as well. And uh, if it's a great place to just learn more about Bitcoin and ask us uh, any questions that you have. And you can buy Bitcoin there too. And we have some fun contests. And yeah, take some time out of your day to really get um, inspired. Hi. Um, I just wanted to bring something up um, that I think people kind of overlook. I hear a lot of times uh, people talk about saving the transaction fee, which I, I think people see as kind of small. Um, it certainly can add up, but um, as an online merchant, I think, uh, I think most customers don't realize just how much it costs us to be a part of marketplaces, to be on eBay, to be on Amazon. And uh, the thing that I saw when, when I looked at, when Silk Road came out and I looked at it, I saw this is our freedom from Amazon and eBay, from companies that take 15 to 25% of our transaction every time. Because as an independent seller, as a small business, it's very, very difficult to get very much market share to your own site, to your own store. Um, but Bitcoin technology allows us to, to have a decentralized marketplace where we can completely get around that. If I sell an item on my own site or if I was to use a developed decentralized market like a, what I hope Open Bazaar will, will be, um, the difference can be really substantial. Sometimes I would sell an item on uh, Amazon Marketplace and make uh, a dollar or even less profit on it, but if I sold the same item on my website for Bitcoin, maybe 10 or $12 of that is profit. And it's just an enormous difference. And um, on top of that, um, the chargebacks on those sites, they go directly to the merchant. The merchant pays for that. If there's fraud, the Amazon doesn't pay for it. The payment processor doesn't pay for it. The merchant pays for it all. Um, and they, they have a history of, uh, of freezing funds. This happened to me. I had a, a competitor who filed a, a false uh, trademark complaint against me. All of my money, all of my product that was in Amazon warehouse is frozen. Wow. You can't get a hold of anybody. You get... Um, you get bottom level tech support that knows nothing about trademarks. You can't call anybody. Um, you're just, you're out of your money. And I, in my case, I had to sue my competitor to get them to retract the statement to get my money back from Amazon. And there are people, uh, merchants out there who have their entire business 
on those platforms who have millions of dollars in those accounts and product that um, uh, that Amazon is just just holds indefinitely sometimes. Um, and I so I think it's uh, it's really easy for people to under underestimate just how much money um, a technology like that could uh, could save merchants. Um, so I just I just wanted to put that out there. And, uh, I'm curious in the audience here, who here, and don't be shy or embarrassed, uh, does not have a Bitcoin wallet? Okay, so yeah, like about, th what, a third, 20%, something like that? That's actually, this is really unusual. I mean, yeah. you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So a lot of times I've found that, I'll give speeches about Bitcoin all over the place, and people come up to me afterwards and sort of pull me aside, and they have all these questions. And so often they don't know what their questions are, you know? Uh, they're just sort of, sort of meandering around. It's a sort of a vague sense of they don't know what the hell the, all this is about and want me to explain it to them. But invariably, what, what, what it really comes down to is that they don't have a Bitcoin wallet and are not owners of Bitcoin. So they don't have, you know, there's, they don't have a stake in Bitcoin yet, and they don't really understand it, partially because they're not owners. So I, I agree with this idea that you know we should just give people Bitcoin. I well, I encourage everybody to download a wallet. And my I don't know what wallet. Maybe you could all just share your favorite wallets. I mm -hmm. I use blockchain.info. I don't know. I use blockchain for a hot wallet on my phone. I use paper wallets for larger amounts, and also mycelium is is good if you want to have like a backup. Yeah, I have a blockchain uh, hot wallet too. Mycelium's on my phone. I like that one the most so far. I've tried a few. Um, Electrum's great for your computer. Um, it's really simple and it generates new addresses. And for cold storage, I use Armory and just you know Brain Wallet kind of stuff. So, but that's you don't. That's jumping way ahead. Um, but, and but I, th I think it's important that people become owners even before they understand it yeah. because that's. That, that, that sometimes is the beginning of your understanding, you know, once you become an owner of it. And I want to make one point, too, about giving Bitcoin away, which seems like, it sounds like a really great way to get people involved. But from my experience and the experience of others, when you give someone Bitcoin, um, you f it feels like they don't appreciate it or understand that it has value when it's given to them for free. It's like with a kid. If a kid's just given an allowance for doing nothing, they'll be more frivolous with their money. If the child has a job and is earning that, they actually think about that money as a store of value and something they've earned. So I would even encourage people in the industry to, uh, when they're doing the intro, to maybe get the person to buy something or, uh, which is more difficult maybe, but I think the person in the long run will feel like, oh wow, I, I Paid for something, or I received, or um, I sold something and received this Bitcoin, and it's like a real That's thing. That's an interesting point. When I yeah. got my first Bitcoin, it was because I sold sold bow ties. Yeah, yeah. didn't you jump you. around with enjoy? Well, well, that was after I spent it. <laughs> 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 that was the, it was it was a weird moment because I it's just. Every once in a while, it happens to you in life that you, you sort of see the future, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me the first time I used Bitcoin to spend it. I thought, okay, that's it, you know? This, this is the future. I, did, I knew it immediately. You know, when that future is, I don't know, but it was, it's obvious how much more superior yeah. it is to, to nationalized money. Yeah, my friend, uh, my friend Amir, he, he was a very early adopter, and he would just send all his friends like hundreds of Bitcoins, and then, you know, Two years later, when it's like, <laughs> almost none of them had it. They spent, like, they just lost the wallet or, you know, forgot their uh, private key or their passphrases. And, <laughs> you know, so that was like a really strong illustration for me that's, of people not valuing. I know, I know. And in even Trace, uh, our friend Trace Mayer, he, would, he was telling people to get into Bitcoin at three cents. And almost nobody listened to him, but the people who did listen to him consider him one of their best friends now. Uh, so those are just a few, you know, a few stories there. Well, when did you get, like, not when, but how did you get your first Bitcoin? Well, when I first tried to get Bitcoin, I had no idea what I was doing. And I thought that, okay, I need to put Ubuntu on my computer so that I can store it somehow safely. I really didn't understand anything. I didn't know anything about Ubuntu, so I deleted all the files off of my computer, and I didn't have a backup, because I had no idea what I was doing. And then I took it into the computer shop, and I was like, can you please save my, can you, can you get my files back for me? And he was like, no, no, they're all gone. 
And then, and then he said, I said, does this happen a lot? And he was like, no, people that are interested in Bitcoin know how to store Bitcoin. This does not happen a lot. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, eventually I found out how to do paper wallets. And I got a printer that's offline. And uh, so now I'm, I'm doing that. I got a lot of help from friends and people that knew about Bitcoin. And uh, That's really cute that you thought that if you were going to get into Bitcoin, you, you probably had to have a Linux-based operating system. I yeah. thought that. It's just yeah. like, like hyper geek. That makes sense. You know, yeah, like, like, right? it it was whatever kind of extreme geeky thing. I have to learn how to code. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you that's really on funny. on Windows, right. I, I got my first Bitcoin from Redmond Weissenberger of Mises, right. Canada. I went to his house, gave him some cash, <laughs> got my Bitcoin, and a few days later, it went up to 1,000. And I was like, ah. oh my god, I doubled my money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wish I bought more. <laughs> you know, I get, do you get tipped all the time on Twitter? I, I get uh, Twitter tips all yeah, the time. Change tip. Ch change yeah, change tip. Change tip allows people to tip, tip him Bitcoin. So actually, I make a lot of money this way. Yeah. It's very strange. I mean, just. You know, just blogging and getting getting tipped in Bitcoin. And it's that's wonderful. a good way to start uh, with your Bitcoin wallet because you can have a wallet through them. So if you come to the Bitcoin booths um, and you have Twitter, I can tip you in Twitter. You'll get a little link. It'll go to your, a change chip account. And you just make an account, like a login and a username and with your email. And it will have a wallet already in place for you. And the tip will, you know, realize itself once you make the account. Then you can tip me uh, and enter a contest to win uh, a beautiful piece of Bitcoin art, which is worth $200, and a few other runner-up prizes. So be sure to stop by and maybe do that, because that could be a very simple way to start your wallet, just very basically. And then you can work your way up from there. Yeah, I've gotten some tips from liberty.me on my, my articles. Yeah. yeah, people have tipped me. That's nice. Yeah. And get some on Reddit. Not none from Twitter yet. Yeah, earn your Bitcoin. That's the best way to do it. Like you don't have if you if you're very concerned about privacy and all of this, you don't need to sign up with uh, Coinbase or anything like that, or uh, provide a product or service or start writing. And people will tip you and pay for your services. You know, sign up for Liberty.me and start participating. People will tip you. That's the best way to accumulate Bitcoin. And that's how I I've only bought Bitcoin maybe three times in my entire life and I earn most of the rest. Oh, just one quick point. I don't think I've ever shared this with anybody before, but when I first started buying Bitcoin, you know, I've got a complicated banking system, so I have my own business, and I have my private accounts, and this and that. So I spent uh, my, my um, I used my business account to buy uh, Bitcoin, and after about the third time I did it, I got a call from the bank, and they shut my account down. Yeah. And I mean, I was shocked. I said, well, we just, we, you know, I asked, you know, why did you do this? And they're like, well, we, we can't really tell you. Uh, we just, we just can't, we can't carry this account anymore. And that was it. So I went over to Wells Fargo and I said, because I thought it might have had something to do with Bitcoin, but I hadn't put it all together yet uh, in my mind. I just, I just didn't understand what was going on. So Wells Fargo said, you know, what's the story uh, with you guys at Bitcoin? They said, oh, we love it. We don't mind if you buy and sell it at all, uh, as, long as, you don't do, as long as you do it with your personal account and not your business account. And so that's when the light went off. I realized, oh, I use my business account, the business account to buy the Bitcoin. And that, that tipped off the compliance. It's not so much the government. It's like worse than the government. It's bank compliance officers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And they're like extremely risk averse, and they don't want you using your your uh, business account to buy and sell uh, Bitcoin. Or if you do, I think you probably need to be registered as a money transmitter or something like that. So basically, they saw me as uh, you know doing something extremely edgy. But I mean, from my perspective, it wasn't. I just selected the wrong account. I mean, that was it. I just bought with my business account instead of my my personal account, which you wouldn't think would be a big deal. But to bank regulators, that's a that's a very big deal. I think that we're over time, but if you have more questions, just come find us afterwards. Thank okay. you. Thanks so much.